Today I want to tell you a story about a classical biological control uh, story. This is an importation biological control having to do with the control of weeds. Um, this is a different kind of pest. This is a plant pest rather than an insect pest. And the control happens by the introduction of herbivores, which suppress uh, the population uh, of the pest. But let me start here with this uh, beautiful plant uh, that's uh, worldwide that you can see behind me, the uh, prickly pear uh, cactus. Uh, these are plants, uh, cacti in the genus Opuntia. Uh, it's a New World genus, so-called New World uh, genus. It occurs in the Americas, from uh, South America, Argentina, all the way up into, actually you can find them in Wisconsin as well. But there are several uh, areas, uh, centers of endemism that center on uh, Mexico uh, and um, uh, South America. Uh, because of the various uh, uh, attributes of uh, Opuntia, this plant has been moved around uh, all over the world. One of the features that it has is that this plant is colonized by a little insect, uh, a scale insect, that is uh, referred to as the cochineal uh, bug, the cochineal uh, scale. And the cochineal scale, you can see kind of the uh, waxy secretions of the scale uh, here that it uses to protect itself. The scale can actually be uh, removed from the pads and used to make a dye, a red colored uh, dye. Uh, it's uh, here you can see some of the, uh, the infestations on the prickly pear pads. These are called cladodes. Uh, and uh, again, you can see kind of the waxy secretions and the, the scales occur underneath uh, those secretions. This is a feature that, uh, uh, an attribute that has been ex uh, used for, uh, for uh, hundreds, uh, if not millennia uh, of years uh, by local populations such as the Inca um, and um, groups in Mexico to make these uh, wonderful uh, dyes and garments that they would use to, uh, to dye wool. Uh, the British, in their colonial uh, expansion, uh, recognized this and they made their army uh, jackets uh, in this red color. That's why we call them the British, the Redcoats. And during their period of expansion uh, and imperialism, as they moved into Asia, into India, and into Australia, they moved the prickly pear with them uh, so as to establish a local industry and a supply of cochineal uh, dye. It's thought that uh, the first introduction into Australia was in the late uh, 1700s, 1787 here, um, and it wasn't long before it uh, prickly pear really made itself uh, in through the entire country uh, here. After a relatively uh, benign period of uh, maybe you know 80 to uh, 80 years, the prickly pear really started to spread uh, rapidly into areas that it wasn't um, uh, introduced uh, introduced into uh, originally. Uh, not only was it used for cochineal dye, but the farmers and ranchers there also used it for uh, fencing. They would kind of plant it in uh, little lines where they then could put their animals in there. It has spines, so animals don't like to eat it, and they could kind of be kept uh, kept in there. So this is a convenient way to pen your animals up without having to put up things like barbed wire, which uh, was not really uh, invented until after the, the early 1800s. But of course, plants don't sit still, and uh, this is what uh, happened after a relatively short amount of time. Uh, you know, if you count 100 years, a short amount of time. It really expanded into uh, the interior, uh, making uh, millions and millions of acres completely unusable for uh, livestock. Here's the, some of these would grow uh, quite, uh, quite tall, and it was uh, um, established as a a cat as a pest uh, by the local government. Uh, and he, this is an article from uh, 1922. There was a legislation that was passed to try to control uh, prickly pear, including, um, you know, at first an acknowledgement that this was a problem by the late uh, 1800s. There was the Prickly Pear Destruction Act uh, in 1886 that made uh, landowners responsible for destroying the plant. Um, in 1901, the Queensland government offered a reward for people who attempted to de destroy the prickly pear. And uh, here you can see a picture of uh, one attempt to actually control it using chemical methods. This was so-called Robert's Improved Pear Poison, where uh, this was a, a boiling hot mixture of sulfuric acid and arsenic that kind of wafted out of these uh, carts. 
and um, was supposed and kind of poisoned and uh, you know was was caustic and uh, damaging to the plants. And as you can imagine, this was only good uh, very near where these boiling pots actually were, and not uh, and couldn't be used to control uh, vast swaths of uh, uh, of prickly pear in the uh, in the outback. There were other methods of control, including kind of mechanical clearance, hand harvesting, and uh, the recognition that uh, various animals uh, were responsible for spreading the seeds of Opuntia, including emus, which you can see here, uh, crows, uh, magpies, and so on. And there was a bounty uh, put on, uh, on these animals that the government would pay for. Uh, so hundreds of thousands of emus were slaughtered to try to slow down the spread of, uh, uh, of, these, uh, of this cactus pest. By 1925, uh, the total infested area was over 24 million hectares. Um, this is uh, well over uh, 50 million uh, acres. As you can imagine, uh, the idea of uh, biological control was starting to uh, take hold and uh, folks recognize that there's the possibility that maybe there's some um, herbivores that could be used to um, control uh, the expansion of this uh, particular pest. The Queensland Prickly Pear Traveling Commission was formed to try to find uh, potential biological control agents. This was not really uh, successful. In 1920, uh, a new board, the Commonwealth Prickly Pear Board, was established, which then replaced, uh, retraced the steps of the uh, commission and uh, collected over 50 different species of insects uh, to bring back to Australia to explore them for uh, potential use against, um, against uh, prickly pear, against Opuntia. In, uh, ev eventually there was a breakthrough uh, where a specific insect, Cactoblastis cactorum, it's got a wonderful name, uh, which had previously failed its uh, tests for introduction, uh, actually was able to establish a breeding population uh, of adult, uh, adult moths in Australia and was shown to be uh, host specific, that is it only fed on Opuntia, it bred prolifically and uh, it uh, actually laid its eggs in a series of little uh, egg sticks that uh, could be used to transport and release them in various parts of uh, where, uh, where prickly pear was established. This is what the moth uh, looks like. It, here it's doing a headstand. You can see it laying its eggs as a uh, little stick here. Each one of these little rings, it's hard to see the, the segments. Each one of these little rings is actually a single egg. Um, the sticks might have 50 to 100 eggs, uh, perhaps. Here's a photo that I took out in the field uh, just uh, recently. They look like the spines on a cactus, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, the larvae are these uh, very brightly colored uh, orange and black uh, pyralids. The Cactoblastis moth was unbelievably successful at uh, suppressing the population of Opuntia. Here you can see kind of a before and after picture. This is the same uh, signpost here, C37, the same couple of trees. And the moth absolutely laid waste to uh, uh, to these populations. And even today, it's uh, considered uh, maintained well under control by, uh, by Cactoblastis. Um, it's not completely gone, uh, Opuntia that is, uh, but it's, uh, it's maintained at, at significantly lower levels. Let's fast forward uh, 30 years since the introduction of Cactoblastis into Australia to this idyllic little island of Navis and St. Kitts in the Caribbean. The farmers there were having trouble with uh, Opuntia in their pastures. Uh, they had goats, uh, primarily sheep uh, in some areas. It's a small industry and uh, they looked to Cactoblastis uh, for control of Opuntia. They released uh, the moth there in uh, 1957. Uh, here's where Navis and St. Kitts are in the, uh, in the Antilles here. And um, not too far from Puerto Rico and obviously the, uh, uh, the US uh, mainland. Now, the issue with the introduction into Navis and St. Kitts 
is that um, this is an area where Opuntia is actually native to. This is a, a movement of uh, uh, the moth from southern, uh, the moth that is native to uh, southern, uh, to South America, to the southern parts of the of the continent, to an area north of the uh, of the equator uh, that has other Opuntia species that actually are susceptible to uh, to Cactoblastis, where Cactoblastis is not normally uh, found. This is also an area with uh, frequent hurricanes, and it was found that uh, the moths from uh, Navis and uh, St. Kitts here have a high likelihood of being transported to, uh, to the neighboring islands here through, uh, through hurricanes that blow the, the adult moths from uh, one island to the next. There's also, to a lesser extent, the movement of Opuntia uh, for ornamental and horticultural reasons uh, among the, uh, the islands. Um, it was not shown that the moth itself is very capable of just hopscotching from island to island uh, just by flight uh, alone. So over time, um, this moth uh, has been able to actually spread into uh, away from this original area of release into other areas. When you look at the potential suitable areas where this moth can be found based on climate uh, um, envelopes, uh, this is where Cactoblastis is originally native to, and uh, everything that is kind of dark uh, here are places that have comparable climates that would allow the moth to actually survive and uh, reproduce. And uh, one of these areas here is the Caribbean and the southern U.S. and parts of Mexico. Um, it's uh, also quite uh, suitable here in South Africa and Australia, obviously where it was uh, released into uh, parts of Kenya uh, and so on. And these are actually where introductions of the moth uh, have been made. There was also an introduction into Hawaii. This was an intentional introduction where there are no native uh, Opuntia here. So certainly moving the moth from here into any of these areas would mean that there's a high likelihood that, would it, that it would spread uh, to because of the, the suitable climates. And in fact, uh, this is uh, what, what uh, was uh, observed. Uh, the moth uh, appeared here in uh, Florida Keys uh, in 1989, and slowly over time it uh, spread uh, northwards uh, and uh, along the, uh, the Gulf Co Coast as well. It had reached Dolphin Island in Alabama by uh, 2004, so this is uh, you know approaching um, you know 20 years ago, uh, not quite. And uh, uh, just uh, last year, it was actually found uh, having crossed the Mississippi, which is uh, one of the uh, kind of barriers that folks uh, were hoping that it that it wouldn't cross. And now it's kind of hops, hopscotched past. Uh, Houston into Brazoria County. Now this area here of the southwestern U.S. is an area with a high level of endemism and uh, in particular in northern Mexico. And it was also found in the Yucatan Peninsula uh, in uh, uh, 2019 where a very intense and concerted effort to control it uh, was, uh, was embarked upon. And uh, from what I can tell, uh, this it was successfully eradicated from uh, from the Yucatan through uh, a, a process of kind of um, scouting uh, and hand collecting and destroying of the moth uh, wherever it was actually found. This is uh, again the op where Opuntia species are actually found in the the U.S. Um, lots of uh, endemism here in the uh, desert southwest and in particular in. Uh, in Texas uh, as well, not to mention Mexico. Where I am right now actually is uh, here in uh, coastal Georgia on Sapelo Island, uh, one of the places where in uh, the year 2000 the moth was, was found. What I want to do next is actually take you out with me in the field uh, to actually see these uh, infestations uh, and see what, uh, what Opuntia looks like uh, in these areas.